If we could call the regular uh, monthly meeting of April 24th of the University of Central Village Board of Education order by standing and pledging the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Mr. Engel? Present. Mr. Zappa? Here. Mrs. Gillis is absent. Dr. Messer? Present. Mrs. Wackel? Present. So this evening before we adopt the agenda, we're going to go on a tour of the JBS. We have, <clears throat> Corey, do you want to talk a little yeah, bit first? I will. Um, I said hi to most of you are walking in. My name is Corey Thompson, treasurer here of Rank County JBS. The superintendent is out of town at the moment. He sends his uh, regards. They welcome you to the school district. I welcome you to the school district. So does I'm sure Rex and Deb Melder, our vice president, represents Easttown. Thank you for taking the time to be here. We appreciate that um, our social school is coming in and actually to see what your students, our students, they are together, our students. What they're doing, part of the school building, the programs that we offer, and, and um, we actually get to see what the will be in the lab. Uh, I'll be introducing Eric here in a second, but um, to see what they do and partake in it. So, you know, Marine County JVS, I think we have 32 programs at the moment that we offer. We have our enrollment is up to, I think, 1,500 uh, students overall in the school building, coming from 13 different school districts, you guys being one of them. Our adult ed program runs at night, so there are programs running at this moment as well. So we do service the adult education. Uh, there is no boundaries with age caps. Now, uh, younger, we do have a preschool program. <laughs> so the kids do come in, so we serve all uh, ages. But um, I won't chew a lot of time. I just want to say thank you for being here. You are the fourth school, the uh, associate school to show up. So we appreciate We're starting to get better at what we do in this tour because of that. But um, we do have. You saw some handouts the school has. I believe everybody will have the bag. The bag. Yeah, that's from our uh, marketing department. Just a little thank you of, and token of great uh, appreciation. We do have some food in the back afterwards when you get back. That'll be for yours to grab when you want. Um, get back to the tour. For this point, um, I'm going to introduce Eric McGuire. He is in the Precision Machine Technology Program. He is an Amherst student, so I'm going to give you the Eric the floor here for a couple of minutes. He'll talk a little about himself. Feel free to ask questions now. And as we go to the lab, which is this precision machine technology, um, he's going to give you a small demo of the here. So, so hi, my name is Eric Boyer. I am a CNC machinist slash amateur programmer. I went here to the JVS to try and find my footing. I had a general idea that I wanted to be a machinist ever since I was 10 years old. Before I was in the Grizzly School District, I was a Lorraine City Schools kid, and I transferred my halfway through my eighth grade year. I came into your guys' school um, kind of having good grades, and then I fell off for a little bit, and once COVID came around, I realized I had to get to my act together because I had received my JBS acceptance letter, and I started pushing my life around a little bit. And I have been pushing myself throughout JBS, even as a sophomore, I was in that lab trying to learn things about CNC manual, 3D printing, and I actually already have uh, college hour credits thanks to the um, assisting modules that we do in lab. I know how to take these big machines and carve actual pieces of manufacturing metals out of it. Um, I don't believe any of you know about this, but the city of Amherst commended us to make 50 flag holders for houses around the Amherst area. Precision Machine Technology Lab is actually the one taking care of that order that's coming in soon. I am actually one of, one of the people that is helping with that currently. And Amherst has always been a safe place for me. It's always been very nice to come here and do things. And not only this school, but Amherst has helped me excel as a machinist. Is there any questions? Anything at all? We'll put here for the flag holders. Are you or someone in the department like designing them, or is there a sort of design you found to match um, what you we requested? Were given, we were given an old flag holder that you had guys had just had laying out. What we did is we reverse engineered it by taking the measurements from it, and making an accurate three-dimensional drawing, and then actually 
sitting there coming up with the manufacturing process to help manufacture those. And then we basically put them together and we're going to pass them over to the welding lab. And then we're going to pass them back over to our lab to do some finishing off processes, make them look nice, and then we're going to send them back to you in the boxes. Great, great process. Mm -hmm. You're okay. working on the project right now, are you not? I'm working on two projects. You're going to show us, you're going to do a little bit of your demo on one of the projects. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm going to tell you guys about both projects because I think one of the projects mm -hmm. in particular is actually going to concern Amherst football. Um, I actually have the ability to make barbell weight bars, like mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so, literally, if you guys wanted, I could actually manufacture um, new weights for the football team. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions? For the meeting minutes, I would love your full name. Uh, Eric Daniel McGuire. Eric Daniel Can you spell your last name? M-C-G, the G is capital, mm -hmm. U-I-R-E. Very good, thank you. Is it Eric with a K or a C? It's a K. <gasps> is it? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. And Eric, how many other, are there any other Amherst students in your program? There is one. Um, me and him are not on the same level of machine. Sure, no, sure, I understand. And how many students are in the total program? For seniors, we have eight. Um, for all together, it would be 26. Because mm. there's a lot of juniors we have. And you, were, you did this year, junior year as well. Mm -hmm. Did you do a summer intern program? I did not, um, mostly because I was how do I put this? I was over in Sandusky for most of the summer with my uncle. Okay. He has his own custom machine shop that he made trying to refine my skill over the summer. Okay. So you were, I just wondered, because I know there's a lot of interning going on during the junior senior year. And I just wondered if you were one of those students last year. But you do have a job already this year, right? Yeah, well, I'm starting this Monday. I actually have two jobs, one at a machining company and one at a fast food place. I work at the Artisan Cooper Foster. Okay, great. Eric, is welding part of this program? Um, welding and precision machine technologies are two separate entities entirely. Um, we're right next to each other, so we partner on projects frequently, but we are two separate distinctions. Good, thank you. What's the machine shop you're going to be at? Um, Betcher's Industries in Birmingham, Ohio. Nice. They make um, hand cutting tools for processing and patching. Packaging meats. They own ninety-two percent of like all meat processing plants all over the world. Betcher is a fabulous company. I know fifteen bucks an hour just for being an intern. Yes. yes. Do you have any other questions for him before he takes us on a little hike? Does you have safety, have, um, safety glasses? We got safety glasses right here. For everyone. Okay. So as we're going down this hallway, I'd like to mention that this is the manufacturing hallway. Basically, anyone who is involved in automated or manufacturing processes and everything, this is their hallway. On this side of this, we have like car labs and such. On this side, however, we use academic classes. I believe not that one, but the Next one is an English class that I had my junior year, and then the very next class is my current science, uh, math, yeah, math class. <laughs> um, this is auto technology, which the very next lab, yes, the very next lab is a ninth and tenth grade lab that we use for our sophomores and our freshmen, where they actually get to learn the basics of changing oil on a car or changing the brakes and stuff like that, actually teaching them real life skills. And as we keep going, at the very end before this staircase that is coming up, we have our engineering department. into there right now because it's currently closed, but the lab itself is called EDT, Engineering Design and Technology. Do you want to get in there? Huh? Do you want to get in there? Uh, no, actually, <laughs> I... You work and let us in if you want to get in. No, I actually am not allowed to get in there because it's a separate program entirely. Oh. Right here, actually, some of their projects that they have custom 3D printed over the years. 
from very complex things like a working clock up to things like Lightning Queen from the Lightning Queen <laughs> series. And if you guys keep coming this way, if you guys will keep coming this way, we have the back entrance door to the PMT lab. We won't be going through that way because it's an even tighter hallway than this one and we have a lot of people. We have also industrial mechanics, which is like farming vehicles that uh, are used um, to mass manufacture farming goods and such. Now, in here is where PMT's design room is. That down there is for engineering. We actually use a master cam program, which we can get access to. Basically, I can use master cam in there anytime I want because we have a student grant. They took it down from $15,000 of subscription, which each student in the current program has a seat or has a subscription to $2,000, which the school then pay for, for each of us. This is actually welding like you guys were talking about earlier. They actually have um, manual manufacturing machines like we're going to have in here, but what they don't have is the CNC machine that's in here. Now the lab on the manual side is a little bit messy, um, just because of the fact that I was working in there today and some of the other students were. And I told them not to clean it up because I would clean it up after I was done with this. Past the yellow line, you are allowed to step, step outside of it. But this is what's called a seat seat lane. And it's pretty good. It's going to make a couple loud noises before it actually officially starts filming. I'll explain the basis of it. Basically, this is called a chuck. The way a lathe works is it spins the metal part and it has a cutting tool in here that actually can go along and cut layers upon the machine. So say you want like something simple like a bearing, right? This can automatically make it and simple metal parts like a bearing can take up to three minutes to make on the low end. And something that's as complicated as a T-slot cleaner can take 17 minutes on average. Now, when I go into this, this is called the FANUC module. And basically what I go and do is I press reset and then power up restart. And then it's going to move in here if some of you want to come closer. Basically, this right here is going to manually reset itself to where it's going to push itself back so I can select an operation that I actually want to go and press. Currently, it's going into active work mode with this G54 code. I know I'm probably saying a lot of things you guys won't understand exactly what I'm saying. But G54 is the SAR code that helps it actually run. But say if I were to put G54 or MO3 um, S500, that would run it at about 500 uh, RPM, which would make the spindle actually spin at 500 RPM a second. So this is spinning about 500 uh, RPM in a full minute. I can actually turn the other one on, which is a mill. I can make sure that And now this one is a very expensive thing. That one's currently ready to go for a manual for automated mode, which can be used to manufacture different things. Oh, and it has the program. Okay. So right here. This is a written program that runs for about 20 minutes. This actually warms up the spindle so that way it can run more efficiently. Usually whenever we don't run it, something may happen like the tool falling out of the tool which currently it has a mill for the end. That is a 4 mill. 
that you would use for regular everyday things. But this machine, this machine specifically, is currently estimated at seventeen thousand dollars. That one is currently estimated at thirteen thousand. So all in all, around thirty branches for these two singular machines. And if I go ahead and press this, the inside of the spindle actually starts moving, and this heats it up so that way it runs more efficiently. Back here we have the CC modules that basically, if you saw this on the side of the machine, um, we actually use custom tools for them. They're used for student teaching mode. So before we actually load up a program onto that machine, this virtually simulates whether the part is actually moving out correctly. And an interesting fact I want to bring up about manufacturing. In 1942, the world relied on 96% of its workers in manufacturing alone. And as of today, we only rely on 35%, which means that it's worked to triple. And the thing is, we now run at five times the speed of consistency. If you guys want to come this way, Over there, where all the chips are, if you'll notice, um, basically that is a project I am currently working on for myself, which I believe is part of my I'm going to stay back. Loaded in this is a block of 6160 aluminum. And basically, what this does is with these levers that are here and here, I can move this. And this is why algebra is super important is this moves it along the x axis, and this moves along y. And this lever actually can move in C. So, if I go like this, and push into the part itself, metal chips will actually start flying off the machine, and if the material will actually be able to take a better shape than what it once previously had. For custom projects that we are using to build different things. Back when we came into the start of the lab, it was actually a table. I don't know if any of you noticed it, but it actually had a table full of projects on it that would be manufacturing supplies to switch repeatability and difficult problem solving. Over here is what is called a lathe. Now, I can't run this machine right now because I've not finished setting it up for the operation that is currently set up. But have you ever seen a long a flagpole? Everybody knows that flagpoles are probably manufactured somewhere in their main. Now, if you actually look all behind you, there are pieces of stock. Those stock, those pieces of stock are extremely long, are they not? Now, what we usually do with blades is we'll use a steady press to put them into the actual machine itself. And we will take a steel cutting tool, which I can actually get out and show you. It is a little bit covered in wood, so you'll have to watch your hands. But I'll take this along. The end is sharp, so I will say please don't break your finger. But I actually can custom made that tool um, using a grinder that is over there and a piece of high speed steel. And I can literally come in here, make a part with it. The part that they usually have you started off with is. Mr. Dance, but what's the first item in the packet? The center, center punch? The center punch, yeah. 
center punch that we actually sit there and learn how to make was in the first two weeks of being a junior in sophomore. I cannot pump out that same project that used to take me like 45 minutes. And that also actually required algebra because you're supposed to set a 16 degree angle over here, over here, and a 45 on there. And you're supposed to get this a 15 degree radius from the pedal. Because it was actually a self damaging tool since we use that. 30 questions for anybody in here? Other questions, we'll walk you back to the boardroom. Would you guys start your meeting? And uh, any questions like how this makes benefit students or anything like that? Go for it. So, did you know there's actually a CNC factory for high school? Well, it is. It's helpful. Um, a lot of students can get set up right there, it's not that hard. Uh, I actually have certifications in the school that you want to get into a program that you can lay off. 
offsets and no offsets as well. I know how to use program zero, which means I know how to calculate things within a thousand of inch on these machines. Um, I also know the history of how a lathe and a mill were invented down to the down to the back of the caveman. Like the first ever uh, machine. Yeah, so it's supposed to sound like that. Yeah. I know it's bothering you a little bit, but for me too. Uh, just so everybody can hear, our hands just it's been a little bit, so it's not important. Yeah, it's not important. Um, but you also get, um, there's plenty of optional stuff that they have that you can make with your previous, you know, like those people that actually have made those machines, they pay for our tools every year and um, ever since Mr. Green's been a student of uh, this teacher, the last three years, Gene Knox, the man that actually invented those machines, him and Mr. Green are actually somewhat personal friends, and he pays for our tuition as students that go. So, if your students are in this program, Gene Knox might pay for their tuition. Which tuition? Also, certifications that we cost, tooling you, Mr. Green has some college course that you're allowed to take on the side if you want to. NIMS, um, also, uh, Sales USA, obviously. do what he needs to do. One last time to get Eric's input. He's Eric would like to talk to the robotics group at the high school. More mm -hmm. Go to one of their sessions or something. So if we could arrange a time to make that happen. Because he would like, he thinks that, uh, you want to talk about it? Yes, so actually, I'm very okay. much so. I, I think there needs to be more people in the manufacturing area because English I've been around the town, I've talked to the local business owners, the old folks. It was built on older money. Basically, people who were in the manufacturing area, Ford, all those companies, the plants and all that. And I think I could actually do something now that I can actually physically talk to you guys. Because mm -hmm. um, the robotics lab, those people could be such good engineers. We just need to give them the correct tools. Which is why, I don't know if you guys can do this, but are you guys giving any computer grants or anything like that? Because I went to a machining convention recently. I talked to several different companies and several different places that offer free programming, free programming software and everything that is more advanced than what we have. 
they actually could teach you guys stuff we can't even be taught here. And now here's the thing. Some of these kids know about it, some of them don't. I'd like to work with you guys, but there is the possibility of buying mini versions of those machines. Because those machines, super expensive, I understand that. But there are smaller, more compact versions to work on smaller projects, like such as mini mills and mini lathes. A high-end mini mill is $3,000. You could even get manual machines or get drill presses and such. Because a mini lathe, that's a manual one, $500 at hardwood freight. You can literally go pick one up within a day or so. And I don't know if I'd be involved in the teaching process, but I would come in to these meetings or robotics meetings, teach these kids about manufacturing, help them, uh, like maybe even inspire some of them to actually want to go into manufacturing, become an engineer, an operator, a programmer, or a machinist. Because I want to share my passion with Amherst schools. And it's something I've wanted to do for a very long time. I'm just, I'm here, I'm at the JBS. I work and I haven't been in the school building since pre-COVID. <laughs> it's an idea, um, however, I don't have access to my Amherst email because I forgot the password a long, long time ago. Um, I'm free on Tuesdays and Thursdays. If you guys want to reach out to me, I believe my mother's contact info is on there. Mine is as well. And if you guys want to, I will clear out time in my schedule ahead of time to come and talk to these kids to help push them into working on robots or even designing and engineering parts that they could put on the custom robots themselves. Me and my freshman year and some of my friends actually talked about doing this a long time ago. So Eric, if you wouldn't mind giving uh, your, your personal email or the school district email, or you can get it to me. Um, yeah. Because we are um, redesigning the back hallway of steel for students' lives for a new maker space. And so we're going to be putting some classes down there, including uh, an infancy stage for robotics and automation, which is somewhat similar to the program you have, uh, maybe a little more advanced with the actual automation of possibly the manufacturing piece, which you're, you're more hands on with some of it. So yes, um, okay. I know um, everything about it. I can even recommend you guys to the websites where we get our deals. Where, um, because a guy took 20% off of the hundred thousand dollar days that were bringing into this building, he took 20% off of it because it was a school uh, issued um, thing. And with still being such a highly gifted school, because you guys have gotten ribbons and stuff like that, you guys are slightly above the JBS with grades and everything. You guys will be able to get higher grants and be able to afford better machines than public. So we focus on finishing the year graduating, <laughs> and then after we, we get we start working, I think that you know make some connections at Vector, Vector Industries, Industries, then we'll talk to you some, okay? Yeah, they actually have a lot of them have opportunities. Kind of sharp you know, apprenticeship cards, journeyman cards, college courses, they offer it. Yeah. They'll even pay for it if you look. Okay. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Um, um I have one more, more question. Yeah. As a machinist, Eric, what what are the duties of a machinist? I, I hear you talk about programming, design, machinist. Does a machinist incorporate all those, or is that set carved out? You have a programmer that tells the machine to do this, and you follow it, or is that is that as a machinist you encompass all that? A machinist is a mixed breed. Basically, you have the operator, which is on one side of the spectrum. Then you have the programmer slash like engineer. This guy's on the opposite side of the spectrum. He designs, he does that. Now you have in the middle, you have what's is the machinist. The machinist knows a little bit of programming. He's mostly an operator. So what he'll do is he can actually go into the field. He sets up each of these machines, and an operator runs three of the machines. But a machinist, he goes into the company and he sets up. 30 or 40 machines at the very beginning of his shift, and he sets up 
all of them for the operators to then run. And he walks around, he makes sure that the machines are running okay, he makes sure that none of them have issues. Heck, even if the programs have issues because of an engineering mistake, he will then go in and fix that actual mistake because he has to know a little bit of everything. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks again, Eric. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Right. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you again. Board of Education, thank you for being here today. Enjoy your meals. Rex, you know how to exit out. And <laughs> on. You, you can leave your food here. Um, we have a cleaning crew that comes through at night and us will be able to take care of that. So again, thank you. Remember, this is your school too. There's several other programs that if you want to, in the fall we have our open house. You can see all the remaining programs that are out there. You probably have students amongst every single one of them. So um, we're just very happy to be able to see what Eric is to do, what your students do here. So enjoy your meeting. And if you need anything, um, call the open. <laughs> you walk up there, let them know, but you won't be doing that. I'm sure right. that was No problem. You should Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe we're at uh, item four on the agenda. Now we'll be coming out of the tour, which would be the recommendation to adopt the agenda as it is presented in the agenda. Could you entertain that motion? And a second? Motion and a second. Is there a discussion or comments? Hearing none, please call the roll. Mrs. Wackold? Aye. Dr. Messer? Aye. Mr. Jaffa? Aye. Mr. Angle? Aye. Item 5 is the public hearing of the following federal grant applications. Is there anyone here that would like to ask any questions about that this evening? Does anyone here have anything they want to say about these to us? Does anybody here at all have anything from a board perspective? <laughs> if not, we're going to entertain a motion. We don't need a motion. We don't need a motion? All right, hearing of the public. I don't believe anyone has signed up to talk to us this evening. <laughs> um, so, item seven would be the treasurer's report. Um, I dispensed with the report this evening since we had our tour. Um, would you like me to move on to recommendations? I would like you to move right on to item eight. Then. Under recommendations, I would like for the board to approve the board meeting minutes from the regular meeting of March 20th. I have two uh, appropriations uh, changes for you to consider this evening. A new Ohio safety grant in amount of $162,000 and the high school 018 principals fund. Um, increase at $10,000, please. That's needed for graduation and end of year expenditures. Item C is um, a once per year uh, resolution that the board approves uh, the resolution to essentially accept the rates and amounts as prescribed by the county auditor. One of the board members had asked a question about this, and um, I will say as succinctly as I can <clears throat> each year. The county auditor certifies valuations, assess valuations. From those valuations, the effective millage rate changes. And the rates to be collected by the county auditor change somewhat each year based on the effective millages. So this is an annual resolution to accept the rates and the amounts as prescribed by the county auditor and approved by the Department of Taxation. Um, and please know that this is um, revenue that will be collected starting July 1 of 2023, so the next fiscal year. This is the second piece after the tax budget that was approved in January by the board. And then um, item D are all of these donations from our wonderful community. Um, I will not cite them one by one. Are there any questions? We're explaining part C. Yes. <laughs> no other questions or comments, please. Entertain a motion. So moved. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any questions for Amy? Hearing none, please call the roll. Dr. Messer? Aye. Mrs. Wackholz? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mr. Angel? Aye. Mr. Molnar, your report? Yeah, just a few quick verbal updates. First, um, tomorrow night we have the, the third facility advisory committee meeting, which the committee is going to come in. And last time they 
kind of imagine some different proposals and ideas about uh, buildings and our needs for facilities. And so tomorrow night we're going to be looking at those again, but with some uh, numbers attached, what some of the costs might estimate would be, so everyone can really look at those different proposals and see the, the difference between them and then kind of put in on a few more. Um, in addition to that, since our last meeting, we had the privilege, Amy and I and Sarah, um, to talk with Bill Prenisil from the Ohio Facilities Commission, Construction Commission, OFCC, um, just to ask about where we possibly could be with support from OFCC or our next project, whatever that may be. And so glad we had a discussion with him. Um, when I was looking at some of the rankings of where Amherst fell as far as possible support from OFCC or the state, we were like 308. But what I didn't realize and I don't, I don't know, is that there are different categories. And so the category that we are in, which is a category that we have had a project already, Powers Elementary in 2015. Uh, we are in the SEGA 2 category, which would be like a second phase of a master plan. And so that list of where we were at is much smaller. So in the meeting, Bill said that he could not let us know officially where we were at, because every year um, they fund more projects and you slowly move up the list. He said that he should know where we were at, except they hadn't finalized this year's list. And so he said once they finalize that list, we will know kind of where we are in the rankings. And that's important because what he said was, um, if you are in the ranking within two years of a possible funding project with OFCC, then you can start the assessment process where they come in and assess your buildings, your facilities, and start looking at a master plan or continuing a master plan project. If you're more than two years out on the list, then basically you kind of need to wait. But, he said, those that are more than two years out, you can apply for their help program, which, let me take a look at this. Expedited <laughs> Local Partnership Program. Thank you, baby. It's the Expedited Local Partnership Program which if you fill out an application and the board passes the resolution, then it kind of puts you in the queue faster so that you can begin those assessments even if you're more than two years out. So not knowing where we were exactly yet, Bill suggested that we fill out the ELP uh, application and also pass the board resolution, which is on here tonight. I think it's item 13B. Um, in that application, it does have a spot where we're supposed to put a have a projected project date, and he said up on the outset, put something on there, it doesn't really even matter. It's, you have to put something on the application, but that does not hold us to anything. The date, a project, or anything itself. We could basically choose to do nothing in the future, but that's okay. It's still part of the application process. So he encouraged us to pass the resolution, um, fill the application, submit it to him, and then we will be put in the queue and actually would start very soon uh, this assessment process. What they would do is look at the last assessment which was done for the Powers Project in 2015. They would not do a full-blown assessment of facilities, they would do kind of a compressed update of where we've been since then. Um, and so Bill said that could start pretty, pretty soon and be accomplished between 60, maybe 30, 69 days. So we're looking at possibly starting that assessment and have some of these construction commission being a part of that process to then give us some further numbers and tell us where we're at. Because again, when you work with OFCC, <coughs> um, their assessments really matter, right? So we might we might be talking about possibly renovating an order of steel or something. They might come in and say, well, if you get this funding from us and here's the assessment done, you have to replace and not just renovate. So that's why it's very important to know and get their assessments completed. So last week, so that's why that item was on the agenda. Site. Last week, Bill sent me an email and he said, don't submit the application for help yet because he should know by the end of this month, hopefully within a few days, of who they're funding on the final list, which then would tell us exactly where we are. And if we are within two years, we don't need to complete the application. So he said, just hold on to it, we'll pass it anyway, and then we'll see what his response is. 
If it comes back then we're two year, more than two years out, then we'll send in the application and resolution. Okay? So either way, we're going to bring OFCC into this process to help assess our facilities and help us work toward the master plan. Questions on that part before you want another So the, yes, I have a question. Yes. So the numbers that you're presenting to your committee tomorrow night, those numbers came from where? So I contacted GPG, the okay. partners we work with, who, in, uh, and what's the correct term for, we will be working with them also in this pre -bond process. Architects. Pre bond architects. So there are pre bond architects. So uh, I gave them all of the scenarios from the committee renovate steel, replace steel, renovate the work. Build a new junior high for seven, eight. Build a new junior high for six, grade. So I gave them those requirements. They used their official spreadsheet with square footage, and I gave them all the numbers, and they came up with pretty firm numbers of what they believe it will cost from the architectural standpoint. But the Ohio's Facilities Commission will do their own assessment based on the information that they have about us. So they, their numbers could be completely different than the numbers that you're looking at tomorrow evening. So they would want us to work with our pre bond architects, so uh, I'm not sure exactly about that process correct, but it, it, might, it, it probably is in tandem in some ways. They would encourage us to do that and get the, our pre bond architects involved with them. So that's something I can like, follow up on Bill if you like. What another really important item to remember about this ELF resolution for the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission is that it also initiates a 10-year enrollment projection. And we don't get anywhere with OFCC unless we had a fresh enrollment projection. So, so the overall good news is I think it's, it's great that we're getting OFCC involved. It's also great to find out that we might be on a shorter list or we might get some support from the state and OFCC in the near future. And that they're going to assist us with the process of really assessing our facilities and going through the proper process like we did last time for powers uh, to get really solid information about where we might want to see, where the board might want to move forward in projects in the future. But I would also make the assumption that there's some things on the list that you're going to present tomorrow night that would not fall with the Ohio's Facilities Commission. That would be my question. So like nothing like like transportation, nothing no. performing arts, nothing That's administrative. Good. Correct. It would just strictly be building. Correct. Building. Building. Educational building. Correct. Building. Correct. Correct. Yes. Athletics, performing arts center, transportation, building. Those would all And administrative. Be, administrative to add in the local funding. So could they like take they <coughs> let's just say we're thinking of the high school like doing something. They could come back and say, no, not the high school, but north, or vice versa. They they could pick the project. If we end up being in a classroom facilities assistance program, a CFAP. Which is what Powers was, they can absolutely do that, Mark. Okay. They can determine what building or buildings would be co funded. Okay. But, but, well, good, but you did mention on the phone call that I don't know if that's been an issue in the past few years, decade, but he mentioned that there is a new program or process that he, they're, they're, I think OCC is understanding that sometimes. The district might want to do a specific direction or put things in a certain order that they might not they might not do, but that that's not that there's a right or wrong. But what they would do is then they would just apply maybe a specific amount. Let's say let's say we had a specific amount for Nord, we want to do steel. Steel would be a lot more expensive, so that money we could still probably do steel, but that money would be applied just the same amount that we would more for steel. So so I think there's some leeway there, and I think that's. Something he did mention, didn't get into very deeply, but he did mention that um, it's, it's kind of that whole kind of master plan concept. Because a lot of districts, master plans these days have multiple stages, multiple buildings, and wanting to do like read all their own interests at the same time. Or, so, And the particular program that we would participate in with OSCC determines where the funding comes from. So if it was a CFAP, the Classroom Facilities Assistance Program building, there would be a co-funding piece coming from OFCC. That's if the original split that was determined in the master facility segment one planning back in 2015 or what have you. Um, an ELP pro program is what AJH was. And so AJH was, was built according to the Ohio Schools Design Manual. 
So it was according to specifications, OS, OSFC then. And then we received a credit that we used toward the CFAT program for Powers Elementary. So there are different, there's an exceptional needs program, there's a CFAT program, there's the expedited local partnership program. So there are multiple programs which we could participate in with OSCC. But that program kind of determines where the funding is coming from. So <clears throat> obviously with an ELP program or a CFAT program, some portion of it's going to have to come from a local source. So that's the elephant in the room, right? And in both of those scenarios, so the AGH, the way AGH what happened in Wake Powers, they did like the enrollment projection, you know, mm -hmm. like where it's supposed to be, just knowing like all the neighborhoods that are coming and stuff, I don't know how that would affect our current enrollment projection for the building new schools, or if it really wouldn't. Or I imagine it would work with us um, to, to determine exactly that what we look for, what they consider for that. And then I, would, I would assume that people would be talking to them and giving information and other people in contact. But they use a lot of um, data that's already out there, like Bureau of um, Labor Statistics, and um, they look at live births by zip code, and they look at all those things, any new um, um, developments that are coming in, of course, some of those that we're talking about are perhaps age restricted or age targeted or whatever. So they're going to be looking at those and they'll primarily be working with Mr. Molnar mm -hmm. on that. Just knowing that when Powers was built, like, I just remember going on that tour before it was done, and they were like, well, this is whatever room, but it's going to be a classroom in the next few years. I was like, we already know that. We should make it bigger. And they were like explaining that at that point, like that you can't and there's yeah. rules of like everything. Yeah. So and that's, you know, like, that's the thing with OFCC. Pardon me, <clears throat> it's very prescriptive. And the number of students, they anticipate, according to that, that uh, study, is going to determine there's an amount of square feet per student. That's the total building square feet. You can do other creative things like reduce the size of classrooms to build more classrooms. So you could, you could technically be over capacity when you move into a building but you fashioned it as such by reducing each classroom by 10% or what have you. But those are all things that are identified by the pre bond architect. And that's another thing, is we've worked with GPD in the past on a number of different projects besides powers. So next month we would likely bring the contract for pre bond architect, wouldn't we? Possibly. In order to get this process moving. And isn't GPD, um they're, they are an approved, pre-procured contract through a house schools council, as is GDA, then design architecture. Obviously, we have a soft spot for GPD. They've treated us very, very well, been very responsive. One of the, one of the uh, donations actually on the agenda this evening was a GPD foundation grant for power, so promise 2100. This is very good timing, um, you know, a lot of the assessments that they've been doing all year have been completed, right? Because it's the time of year when they're finally finished. I, I would imagine most school districts are going in the summer, so they're not interested in working on, you know, assessments and so on. So this is a very good time for us to jump in. We try to get this in November, December. We would probably be on a waiting list, and we might be getting to this kind of timing in the school year anyway. So um, also, we'll tell the facility, we'll give the facility advisory committee tomorrow an update, and so it's possible that. A main meeting that we were thinking may not happen because it might we might want to wait until we back and come back in August or September. We have all the information, we work with OCC, we have reports, we have enrollment updates, we have it to then continue the committee work then. Uh, and if that makes the most sense for the committee, then we, we may have the last meeting of the year tomorrow night and then re-adjourn again August or September. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, and real quick, I did give um, Transportation Committee update to uh, both Mark and Amanda. And so I want to give to the whole board real quick. Um, and, and that has to do with, we met with the CEO, owner, and, uh, yeah, not only is he, he actually uh, developed the company, of Trackstar, who we've been working with in the police department's been working with for a couple of years now. Um, so we brought the CEO, owner, and creator of Trackstar in to meet with us. We did that um, 
think last last week, early in the week. Um, Police Chief Kaufman also joined us, um, and he came to assess all of our equipment, software, everything from this company. In the discussion, what we what we found and why we're having so many issues over the last couple of years is that when the police department originally went with TrackStar and installed the devices and we, we, we joined them to do that on our buses and so on, um, they went through a third party, which often happens, a third party vendor who possibly may sell a couple of different products. And so uh, that vendor, Bright, was kind of really in charge of selecting devices, putting software together, and how we connect and communicate with that software, which we use Verizon. Um, bringing in the CEO of Mike Hughes, we found out a lot of uh, interesting things. And basically, um, we have found that we did not have the really the correct devices or the software or the connectivity. That's why things aren't working very well properly. So, and originally to fix this problem back in August when we first started, we were prepared to move to a different company, um, Zonar, which we had quotes in I think in the range of forty to eighty thousand dollars for all the equipment, all the changes. Put a pause on it because I think board and members of the committee said, let's look at what we have first. So we did that, it's taken all year. But um, what we found is that we will be able to stay with track star and really put new to put new better devices in it can do everything we want for under two hundred dollars of device per bus and so we're talking instead of forty to eighty thousand dollars we're talking under ten thousand in addition we don't have for example cameras or devices on our vans we've also selected some for our vans as well which will have outward cameras and inward cameras for our kids on our vans and we also found that the connectivity using Verizon, which we're paying about $1,000 a month. Uh, there's another device we can purchase to install that will be about $2,000 per year for everything. So canceling the Verizon, what we do with Verizon, and moving this device through, again, TrackStar and, and Mike Hughes, um, within six to eight months or a year, the savings from Verizon will pay for all the upgrades for track stuff. So we're looking to do that this summer. In addition, a few days ago, we just learned we did receive a safety grant for $20,000. Remember the auditor put out a couple months ago? We did receive that grant. In the grant, we wrote $20,000 would go toward the TrackStar upgrades and also a new visitor's kind of management system where we can track visitors when they come, check their ID, make sure that we have safe visitors coming to our buildings. So that $20,000 should go toward TrackStar and the new visitor system, which we want to do in addition. So that's also just great news. Um, so that's a quick transportation update. Anything I missed, Mark or Amanda, as far as that? I have a question. Yes. So, um, way back in August, we talked about some of the buses that you have. Uh, what was it? Some type of um, equipment on there where it was like an emergency alert button? Yes. This is, yes. Uh, yeah. So. Is that included? Yes, yes, so that, again, that's part of the problem of this connectivity. And going through a third party with Bright, the problem is many of those were not working properly. When we test them, when the police test them, um, we could test all 40, maybe 10 of them work. And so what they found was, again, Verizon saying it's not our problem, and Bright saying it's not our problem, and no one is willing or figure out what the problem is. But we're going to eliminate that middleman. We're going to go straight to TrackStar and using their, their system. And their, so that will all be taken care of, and those will all work flawlessly. In addition, because of those device issues, we could not really use the full gamut of our software. So even though we put up screens for us to monitor buses live, everything like that, some buses would be out and they'd say, they would say that they're still in, in, in the parking lot. And it just wouldn't work. So again, that'll all be eliminated. So um, Mr. Hughes said as soon as we have every device in, he will personally come back. He will train us personally, all of our transportation, and all of our tech people. That's um, next yes, he's coming back personally. He's also personally developing a manual 
for either our mechanics or our third party to install properly. So he took pictures of all of our buses, uh, what we have, our wiring, everything, so that we can install it properly and make sure it's done right. So we'll, we'll create a menu for that as well. We've also selected a different kind of button for the uh, emergency, which is one of those uh, uh, buttons you see probably in the Air Force where, where it has a cover that you can flip open. And then it's actually not a button, it's actually like a toggle switch on and off. So we, everything's going to be upgraded and really where it should have been, I guess, years ago. Who made the decision to use these third party people? Was that the school? Was that us? I know, I think or it was, was that the police department. I think it was the police department because they use, just like we use Vasu for all of our radios right. and everything, they use Bright. So at the time, I mean, it made sense that they were going with Bright, Bright Health Solutions. And and I think they approached the district, but yeah, we'd love to be a part of this safety and security, and it just didn't pan out over the years. It, it actually wasn't. The police department was actually the county. Oh, the county? The, the county. The county? Okay. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we won't get into county contracts. I don't ever recall us having that conversation. No. Right, right. But I know we talked briefly about the vans, Mike. Is there any thought given? Yeah. As far as the, the strobing or lighting or putting something on it. Right, that's something you mentioned in addition to because, um, or can we just share? No, I, I but they were the Friday. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I told Mike, I said it was about quarter to seven, I think. <clears throat> and I was coming down the road and there was a van, one of our vans, picking up a student. But from a distance, it just, there was no really indicators that it was a school van. Right. Of picking up. The child or the kids or whatever. So I had just mentioned maybe we should have something on there to get more of an attention getter to make people aware and not just for it was just the four ways were flashing. That was it. Yeah. And a lot of it was you know denoting you know an, an issue. So yeah. do the vans have one of the stop signs that no. they put up no. when they stop? No, because I've seen a lot of those stop signs have like strobe or LED lights or something like that on them. Yes, when they. Yeah, that's what Monty Mark's looking for. Okay. So we do that. Um, also, the devices that we'll be putting in the buses and the vans, there's input and output. So we're selecting right now what we want that to be. So, for example, we can have the input be every time that stop sign goes out or lights go on, we're tracking that. So if a bus driver does not do it properly or isn't using them, we'd be able to find out with automatic report. We can also do automatic reports, text, emails with the software. So, for example, if we set we set the speed limit for all buses to only be allowed to go two, three, five miles over the speed limit. Um, if anyone goes beyond that, we would get an instantaneous alert, email, whatever. Also, our mechanic will get instantaneous um, emails from the system. So, if bus driver's driving, some sound not right, feeling right, and it's picked up within the um, programming of the, of the bus, that will send an automatic email or text or whatever to our mechanic saying, this bus, as a combustion issue, whether I don't know, I'm not a I don't know what that would be, but it'd be something where you would be alerted right away. Um, which which cuts off the middle man of the bus driver having to maybe do the bus driver having their own check on, on the engine or whatever, whatever. So so it's all, all really good stuff. And a fraction of the cost of what we would think about doing the office. And now the grants can also probably pay for all of it. And we're still working on the app, everybody. Yes, yes. Uh, we've worked with Pick My Kid this past week. Actually, we now have a dashboard for Pick My Kid for AJ Agent Steel. Yeah. They will not be using the dismissal system, you know, the <laughs> reach release kids. But, um, we, you know, a parent cannot sign up for Pick My Kid unless their child is actually in the system. So, like, I could download the app, but my daughter's at Steel. Steel wasn't in the system. So I could not connect to pick my kid to get alerts. So that's why we had to have AJ to still set up in there. And so that's being done right now. And so before school's out, hopefully in the next uh, week or two, we'll, we'll have all of the students uploaded. And then we can send out to all parents for all schools. If you choose to get alerts from transportation, plus 21's late, plus 20's plus 8 today, whatever, um, a parent can choose to sign up for that. Yeah. And the reason we wanted to pick my kid was because we've been kind of doing emails, but no one's checked their email six thirty in the morning to see what bus they are at. Um, and no one wants an all call every single morning if there's a bus delay or something wrong. So that's why I like that parents can choose to pick the app. 
and then they'll get the notification on their phone, just like any other app, and they can pick it and see exactly what that is. Plus, if they have students in multiple schools, yeah, the younger schools are already using it. Yeah. Like, talking, does that work if uh, an alternate bus is substituted for the student's regular bus? As long as, yeah, we, Trish just puts out that message or that text or whatever, yes. Yeah. And I've already talked to Doug Cogdell, our technology supervisor, looking down the road this summer. We're going to be looking at, like, we use School Messenger right now for all of our mass communication, emails or phone calls. That's all we really can do with School Messenger. We've always had emails or phone calls. Um, we're going to be looking at possibly other solutions, maybe that includes texts or some other alerts that we can do. And we're going to be looking at it to not only sync with PowerSchool, but with our bus, bus routing system. So that it can be automatically uploaded of what kids on what bus. And if there's a change in the system, it gets picked up overnight. So if you're bus 20 one day, now you're bus 8, you'll get bus 8 alerts. So all of that's being looked at as well this summer. So. It's, it's been so, I thank you for your patience. But as usual, when you go down a certain path, do kind of, things always seem to work out the right way and the right timing. And so I'm glad we, we kind of didn't pull the trigger on some of these things and make some decisions and spend a lot of money when we didn't need to. It took, it took a year, or at least nine months, but we're, we're getting there. So thank you. All right. That's the end of my report. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, what do you have for us tonight? I would just like to remind everyone that we have our summer activity fair on Wednesday, and uh, we had our final meeting, planning meeting for it today, and it should be pretty great. So fingers crossed and good vibes out into the universe to have good weather mm -hmm. on Wednesday evening, but that will be Wednesday, um, April 26th, from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock at Powers. Park at the Junior High, though. And walk in through the back door. Yes. Any questions for Sarah? Sarah, the clothes donations, you bring them to the event? You can bring them to the event, yep. Bring them to the event. So we'll be doing a comic gear drive. So anyone who has gently um, used comic gear, feel free to bring it along and um, you get a little token, a thank you keychain. For bringing um, comic here. So, anything else for Sarah? JBS. I'm sure you don't want to hear anything else about the JBS tonight. However, will you hear me talk about the projects? If you go down this wall over here, and I'm not going to read them to you all, but that's what we did pre-COVID, and that's where if you look over here at this vision, well, that vision certainly is going to be reality because by 23 we were supposed to have most kids and stuff accomplished. <laughs> And we're, so now, when I tell you that we're bidding on things, we're going back to the drawing board to relook at this. And uh, <clears throat> that's the current cost right there. And that, no, that's not the current cost. That was the estimated cost. We are now bidding that rebid from that perspective. Um, and that bid had not even come in at last week's board meeting. I wasn't at the board meeting, but Deb told me that they didn't have any updates on that bid yet because you know, the prices are still fluctuating so much. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's why when you see what are we going to do if we could pass an issue, which was a 14 that was on the wall before, this is all going to be changed. That's why when you say, are you going to have a letter? We can't say that until we know exactly what it would cost us to do some of that stuff. But you see, if you heard this evening the cost of just one or two machines, and there are complete labs that need to be done. So if you count, not that lab per se, but if you see how many Ways are in there, how many of those machines are in some of those things or pieces of equipment. If not, you're not buying one, you're buying six or eight of them. So uh, that's why it's important, I think, that if this does come to be an issue of a, a levy, that all of the support uh, is important because it's not just like we're replacing one or two, like sometimes when we replace them. Well, that figure don't even fit that one. No, that's exactly <laughs> correct. That's why everything, we didn't take any of it down because we didn't want people to forget about it. But when the facilities that people talk, this has to, this is even being reworked because, for example, the roof is in worse shape now than it was, you know, pre-COVID. So that has to become a priority uh, from that. And then some of the safety inspection stuff 
has moved up on the list also from that perspective. So, okay, just so you're aware. So, if you have any questions, the JBS doesn't fall into the state. We do not. <coughs> no? Okay, we do not. We can't get those dollars. Okay, <coughs> okay? we cannot get those dollars. Okay. So, you know, and just people say, well, you have a lot of money. You know, we are holding a, ch a good chunk of money, but that good chunk of money won't even do two of those projects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, when you're saying, well, why do you need more, if you look at the financial statement, some people think, well, why do you need to ask for this kind of levy money when you have this much in reserves? Well, we could do all of that. I mean, and if something breaks, you know, like when we had a high mm -hmm. break the other last winter when we had the freeze thing, and we had to have water pipes replaced because they're so old, we had to use some of that money. But if we use it all on these projects, then what do we do if we have an emergency? Okay? So, I appreciate you coming out this evening. Eric was thrilled. You are only one of the schools, you are the only school to date that has gotten a demonstration from their student. Okay? And he, he asked if he could do the demonstration, and he certainly said yes. So, um, no other school has had a demonstration, they just had someone talk to them about the program. But he is very excited about what he's doing. And you can yeah, do it. Yeah. I appreciate you coming out and hearing his story. And I think I sent to you all the young lady who won first place in some design. Did I not? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I don't have anything else you have a question. Board updates, otherwise. Amanda, do you have anything this evening? Um, just on the legislative front and then training, but um, just a quick legislative note. Um, they're still discussing House Bill 12, which is the complement to Senate Bill 1 that went through the Senate, so that's still going on, and then uh, still the House is still looking at the budget. So continue to contact the legislator. And also, um, there's a few, and I think we discussed them last month, a few um, like voucher bills and education choice. So again, if you're an advocate of public education, please contact your local um, legislator about that. Um, as for training, so tomorrow, uh, training and just some events. So Mr. Molnar, nice and print these out for everybody. But uh, tomorrow there's a swarm. It's going to be um, really neat with leaders of OSPA, 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 EASA leadership. Um, tomorrow, 11 30 to 12 30 is a free webinar. The Board Leadership Institute is this weekend. I'm excited about that. Um, next month, they're having um, some more free webinars. So we have the coffee chat. This one is life insurance programs. That'd be interesting um, for school districts. Uh, we have another forum and um, some events. Let's see, human capital essential training with Ohio Department of Education in June and another forum in uh, June, free webinar. So those are some of the upcoming training and the fit free events. And uh, Thursday, I'll be in Columbus for our first meeting of the board cabinet. So, excited about that. We'll be meeting with um, the president, vice president of the uh, state board of education. So, that'll be really neat. And that's it. And the foundation did meet last week also. Correct. Right. For scholarships. For scholarships. So, I think the scholarship stuff is all. Probably done. I haven't done it. I haven't seen an email. I haven't looked at all the email today. But I know they met last week to, to do that. So I I would assume that most of those have been decided. Because May 9th is the banquet, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm sure that, I mean that's what that meeting was about, but I was out of town as well, so I didn't attend that meeting. Um, so I just I'm sure that that's done because that was the purpose of that meeting. <coughs> Is there any other reports or comments? If not, we would go to item 11, which would be the personnel recommendations. Okay. The board's had a chance to look at all these um, items mm -hmm. in the agenda tonight and also ask questions. I think we gave me Sarah and I answer all the questions we received, so we'll kiss them real quick. But um, yeah, we have personnel recommendation, mm -hmm. items 11A, 
to an 11S, and most of them are getting to that time of year. We're in contracts, staff is moving different buildings, uh, we're still hiring some subs along the way, and so these are personnel items. Also, you saw a few things on there, supplemental contracts, we saw extended uh, days for the summer for a few staff members, like counselors and others, so um, those are your personal items. I recommend uh, proving personal items 11A through 11S. So, a motion and a second. Second. Question. <clears throat> Just a quick question. What's the what, what's prompting all of the custodians at steel? Is there a reason? Mm -hmm. um, I, I do know that one um, got, a new, got a new position in another school district. I, I think is it where he lives? I think I believe so. where he lives. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, those jobs usually don't leave very often. That's why I was just, is there something going on there? Another one's going into a completely different field. Right, and another one's going into a different field, one that he's going to for a long time. And I'm actually proud that he's making that move. Sure. Doing graphic design. And so mm -hmm. I'm glad he's making that move. It's really something he's wanted to do and talk about for a while. So those are the two that, that uh, those are the two reasons. Yeah, I was just curious, but yeah, normally those positions don't move very often. I mean, when all of a sudden there's two on here. I'm like, hmm, is there something going on there? Is it because they're going in a different direction? Yes, it's good to hear. Any other questions? <coughs> Hearing none, please call the roll. Mrs. Wangel? Aye. Dr. Master? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mr. Engel? Aye. <coughs> Item 12 this evening? Yeah, we have some educational recommendation items, um, A through J. A lot of them are our our agreements with outside agencies and services that we work with almost every year. And so um, I think most of them are for next school year. So I think Janet folded 2023-24 on those to make sure you understand. Some most of those are for next next school year. Um, again, some of them are with um, universities or agreements that we work with. A lot of them are for therapy and uh, students have specific needs that goes to the programs. So those are those 12 uh, A through J. So I'd like to have the board approve items 12 A through J. Motion. Mm -hmm. Any second? Second. Discussion or comments on any of the edu educational recommendations? Hearing none, please call the roll. Mrs. Blackholz? Aye. Dr. Messer? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mr. Engel? Aye. <clears throat> Item 13 this evening. Will be business. Yeah, business recommendations. We have five items A through E. Um, two of them have to do with the uh, roof damage we had at Steel the main gym that we worked with West Roofing. Um, they did a temporary patch at the time, got us through, but now they're going to kind of fix everything, including the gas line that we also pulled at the same time. Also, I think there's one change for the makerspace in E. As I mentioned, item B is the resolution for the ELP program for the ELP facility construction commission. So I'd like the board to approve items 13A through 13 Any motion? So moved. Second. Any other questions? Hearing none, please call the roll. Didn't we have that work done not too long ago? We have worked on all the time, actually. But um, so um, I can ask Chuck. But I know I know that there are some warranties that are, are often okay. playing here. So and insurance will pick up some of the costs, all the costs as well. But um, that's one of the reasons why we do work with West Roofing because their specific uh, system and what they uh, install our roofs is very specific to West Roofing. And so they know again yeah, our history. They know where all the leaks are. In addition to the other parts of the building. They do our assessments, and um, they know the warranties that we have because through that. So I can check with Chuck to see if there are warranties in play for this, okay. in addition to insurance picking up the cost, because we, we, we have a good all the time. And before item 13C and 13D, all of the quotes have been sent on to source of sure. for insurance, um, plus the, co the personnel cost for our employees that came in on April 1st. So all of that has been sent off to source on. Well, and I, and I had that same thought process as Mark did. 
because I thought we had dealt with the roof before we did the floor. Because we had some issues with the roof before we did the floor, even though we had the flooding from the drains issue, which is what really caused the, the worst damage. So <clears throat> I guess we didn't replace or repair the roof, or is it a different part of the roof? That would be my question. Yeah. Right. I'm not sure. I know that it has been sectioned off. The projects that we've done in the past rarely do we do an entire roof. Right. That's it's what I'm a, saying. It's so a section. Is it, at a yeah, time. Is it a different right. section that the wind got to? Because it was wind caused. It wasn't mm -hmm. from rain necessarily as much as it was. Mm -hmm. The only good salvation is it didn't get to the floor. What if that coincides at all with the HVAC project from high school that was about five years ago? So. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, because it, it was around the HVAC system, right? So my question is, then is, there, was there an installation there that wasn't done correctly with the roof from that perspective as well that could have caused that? Because a lot of times the HVAC people don't do what they're supposed to do, which kind of led me to believe that since you had a gas line issue. Yeah. And I mean, does, insurance, um, does insurance kind of go into that a little bit to see if Possibly, it, it was just weather related, and it was just like, I, was it I don't know whether, whether there might have been some fault. Is that does insurance get into that a little bit? I'm not sure. Okay. I'm sure that the adjuster will have final questions, questions yeah. for Chuck and Wes Worthing. Um, so okay. I actually had a very long conversation with our agent and the adjuster um, at the trade show on Thursday. Um, so they are, like I said, they're in receipt of everything. The $16,600 was for thing repair, the almost $1,000 for the mechanical, which was the emergency shut, emergency shut off for the gas line that was tore up. But <clears throat> the gas line fractured or broke because of the roofing that Come lifted on. up, right? I mean, it like Chuck said, it's like the wind got a hold of it at two ends and lifted the whole mm -hmm. thing up so that that line all the way that goes across the roof was, was fractured in that way. So, but okay. I will keep you guys, I will keep the board apprised of what the, um, what the insurance um, proceeds look like, not even that far into it at this point. But. Any other questions or comments? There's none, please call the roll. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mrs. Waffles? Aye. Dr. Messer? Aye. Mr. Engel? Aye. I don't believe there's a need for executive session. With that, we take a motion for adjournment. Okay. Motion and the second is in discussion. Hearing none, please call the vote. Mrs. Waffles? Mr. Zappa? Aye. Dr. Messer? Aye. Mrs. Engel? Mr. Engel? Aye. <laughs>